We're back at it today with our World War II quick study today to talk about Italian and German aggression in the 1930s that will lead us to the Second World War. Now, if you're looking for more in-depth conversations here, uh, you can check out a playlist that I've got on the move to global war that will cover that prescribed topic in more detail. This is just a quick run through. So we're going to start with, with Italy and looking at their reasons uh, that they push for expansion. And it starts with Benito Mussolini and his fascist party and the ideology of fascism that glorifies war and for Mussolini calls for an imperial expansion in order to create a, a new Roman Empire that will encircle the Mediterranean Sea and give his people living space or spazio vitale. Um, it also is coming on the heels of the global economic crisis. Uh, Italians are losing outside investors. Uh, prices are falling uh, for Italian grains. And this is pushing Mussolini towards an autarkic philosophy that, that his country needs to be economically self-sustainable. Um, and he can do this by getting overseas territories. And that's going to begin for Italy in 1935 and 36 with the invasion of Abyssinia. Uh, this is going to push um, the Italians into a new territory in, in Africa that surround, that's surrounded by already held Italian colonies. Um, this is in hopes of gaining support for his government uh, through successful conquests and imperialism. Uh, this is going to avenge a loss that Italy suffered in Ethiopia back in the 1890s. Uh, it can gain colonial troops for future military action. Uh, it can give markets for Italian goods and ultimately demonstrate Italian strength in the world. Now, the results of this Abyssinian invasion are, are many. There, there are few Italian losses, but tremendous Ethiopian losses, including the use by Mussolini of poison gases against Ethiopian civilians dropped from Italian airplanes. Uh, this is going to increase tensions between Italy and uh, Britain and France, which is going to push Italy to a closer relationship with Germany. It's a costly war that actually exacerbates economic problems for Italy, and there's going to be guerrilla conflicts continuing uh, for years to come in Italy, or in Abyssinia, pardon me. And then finally, the League of Nations, who condemns Italian attack, the Italian invasion, will be seen as weak because they ultimately do nothing to stop it. And Italy will just leave the League of Nations, much the same way that Japan left the League of Nations after the Manchurian crisis. In the next year, Mussolini is going to send troops to support the uh, fascist factions of the Italian or of the Spanish Civil War. Mussolini sees this war as an opportunity to expand once again his Italian influence. The hope of gaining naval bases in the Western uh, Mediterranean is also present, and Italy will send 70,000 Italian soldiers into the Spanish Civil War. This is more than any other nation um, will send to support a, a faction in the Spanish Civil War. The results of this, again, like Abyssinia, are high economic costs, a depletion of the Italian military, leaving it weaker going forward, more tensions with Britain and France, and the new alliances that are going to be created between Nazi Germany and Mussolini's fascist government in Italy. Also, um, in November of 1937, Italy will join with Germany and Japan uh, in the anti common turn pact, which is a, a, a international group that is meant to stop the spread of international communism. Now, for Germany's part, um, Adolf Hitler has some of the same desires as Benito Mussolini. He wants living space for the German people, what he calls Lebensraum, and he wants to create a greater Germany, a Germany for German-speaking people by bringing all Germans, whether it be um, in Austria or Poland or Czechoslovakia, into the German nation. Now, he's dealing with economic pressures as well, um, and also um, looking, to, um, looking to overturn the Treaty of Versailles, um, a defeat in World War I that Adolf Hitler, as a veteran of the German army, considers a stab in the back uh, perpetrated by what he calls November criminals, uh, the, the new German government at the end of World War I. The League of Nations is also appearing weak in the face of Japanese and now Italian aggression. And the Treaty of Versailles was already being challenged. The occupation of the Rhineland ended in 1929. Uh, reparations payments were basically canceled by this point. 
Now, in 1933, Adolf Hitler is going to make a demand uh, at the Geneva Disarmament Conference in hopes that Britain and France will start to limit their own arms, um, uh, uh, the, the own, their own size of their military. Uh, the League of Nations is calling for national armaments to be reduced only to defensive levels. But France uh, was unwilling to disarm, still seeing Germany as a possible threat. The Germans under Hitler will, will request that all other nations should reduce down to Germany's limited military as dictated by the uh, Treaty of Versailles. France, of course, will refuse this, and Hitler's going to use that as his excuse to leave the conference and ultimately leave the League of Nations as well. So now you, you, you've, got, you've got Germany, Japan, and Italy all having left the League of Nations. In January of 1935, there's an election in a region called the Saar. Uh, this is a, a Rhineland region, a border region between France and Germany. Um, and in the aftermath of, of World War I, this Saar region had its, much of its coal production heading over to France with a call for a national uh, or a, a, an election of the people, what's called a plebiscite, to decide ultimately should they be a part of Germany or should they be a part of France. And in January of 1935, the people of the Tsar overwhelmingly chose to go with Germany. This is a huge propaganda win for Germany. Adolf Hitler, in the aftermath of the Geneva Conference, is going to now publicly uh, demonstrate his rearmament program. Uh, Germany had long been violating the Treaty of Versailles with regard to their military restrictions, especially with the creation of an air force. And by 1935, uh, this, this expansion of the German military would explode with the army going from seven to 21 divisions um, and, um, and the, the Air Force being revealed to have over 2,500 new planes. In March of 1936, Adolf Hitler will move his army into the Rhineland region of Germany. They were forbidden to do this according to the Treaty of Versailles, but Adolf Hitler guessed correctly that Britain and France would do nothing to stop this move, and they didn't. Adolf Hitler, like Mussolini, will join the Spanish Civil War to support the fascists under Francisco Franco. The German Air Force, we call that Luftwaffe, um, and Navy were each instrumental in the fa fascist victory. This gave Adolf Hitler a chance to exercise his pilots in his new planes. The Condor Legion of the German Luftwaffe would bomb civilian centers and targets, including the town of Guernica that was immortalized by Pablo Picasso. And you can see that behind me. I just never know which way to move. Now, with this uh, Italian and German kind of team up to help the fascists in Italy, we do have new diplomatic alignments like the Rome-Berlin axis between Nazi Germany and Italy and the anti comintern pact to stop the spread of communism. So we are seeing this, this alliance begin, and that's where we get that term axis powers from, as Rome and Berlin are seeing themselves as the center of Europe um, and everything else radiates from them. Now, by 1938, Adolf Hitler, with his rebuilt military, is ready to expand his empire, to create his greater Germany, and to acquire Lebensraum. It starts with Austria, Hitler's home country, um, and with a political union known as Anschluss. Austrian leadership attempted to avoid this political union by calling on a plebiscite of the people to let them decide whether they want to be independent or go to Germany. But before this vote could happen, Hitler sent in the military and then held his own vote, which ultimately voted in favor of a union with Germany and the Anschluss was complete. Now Hitler looked to the Sudetenland region of Czechoslovakia. Hitler's attention goes to Czechoslovakia, where he claimed that many Germans living along the Czech-German border were being uh, mistreated and abused by the Czechoslovakian government, and he wanted control of the Sudetenland region. A meeting was held in Munich, organized by Benito Mussolini. A meeting is held in Munich in late uh, September 1938 to try to resolve the crisis. The outcome of this meeting, called the Munich Pact, would grant the region to Hitler while guaranteeing the security of the rest of Czechoslovakia, which of course Hitler would violate by March of 1939. Now this Munich Pact following the Munich Conference is the British appeasement policy in action. 
The appeasement policy was the official policy of Britain and their prime minister here, uh, Neville Chamberlain, towards Germany. The idea is give in to some of Germany's demands, Hitler's demands, in order to avoid a wider conflict, which nobody wanted. And to prove nobody wanted it, Neville Chamberlain came back uh, from Munich following the signing of another agreement called the Anglo-German Declaration. And he waived this agreement that Germany and, and England would never get into a war with each other and that they would only resolve their disputes through consultation. And he proudly said in front of a crowd at Heathrow Airport that we will have peace in our time. And the crowd cheered him on because nobody wanted a war in 1939. In 1938, pardon me. War is going to come, though, in 1939, with Adolf Hitler looking to Poland. Now, Poland was a new country created uh, following the Treaty of Versailles. And with the creation of Poland, Germany was bisected. Uh, the main part of Germany here with a um, what's known as the Polish, uh, or pardon me, East Prussia, separated by the Polish corridor. Poland's access to the sea. And Adolf Hitler knew uh, that that was not a good situation for Germany to be bisected. And there were many Germans living within that Polish corridor. He called for that area to be internationally recognized as a free city. Poland refused this. Um, and um, seeing that tensions were increasing, Britain and France in March of 1939 after Czechoslovakia was in danger, will guarantee uh, security for the nation of Poland. Before Hitler does anything with Poland, though, he makes an agreement with the Soviet Union. This is called the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact. Adolf Hitler remembers the problems of the Schlieffen Plan and how Germany ended up having to fight a two-front war. This would hopefully avoid that. So Adolf Hitler and um, Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany would sign, or pardon me, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin, Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union would sign this Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the Nazi-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact, where each side would stay neutral should the other party be at war, and they would agree to divide Eastern Europe into Soviet and German spheres. This would help Germany avoid their two-front war. On the 25th of August, Poland and Britain signed a full military alliance. Um, Benito Mussolini, at this point, was not ready for war, tried to organize another conference to try to avoid a conflict at this point. But on September 1st, 1939, Germany would invade Poland and its Luftwaffe would begin bombing Warsaw. Italy was not ready to join war at this point, but would later join uh, the Germans in the next year in June of 1940 with their own invasions of Greece and Egypt. And we'll be back in a couple of days with uh, a quick run through the fighting of the Second World War. Take care.